Drem Yolok, Half Dragons, and welcome to Preseason 11. It's finally here. Dread it, run from it, Riot Games still arrives. I've been playing this game since Season 1, since shortly after release, and I can tell you personally that this is the single biggest change Riot's ever made to the game at one time. The table has been flipped, and God only knows where all the pieces are going to land. Fortunately, I'm here to help you through it, or at least insofar as it pertains to us directly. Now, this video is going to be focusing on systems changes and AP in particular. I imagine I'll make another video at some point about AD and uh, Juggernaut, you know, more, more AD bruiser focused builds, but this video will go on for long enough already and we'll do that, we'll, we'll hit that later when I have more experience running, running with such builds. AP is my wheelhouse, so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So let's get into the systems changes. Let's get the big one out of the way first. Cooldown direction is fucking gone. It is now ability haste. Cooldown Direction scaled exponentially to where the more of it you had, the more valuable it became. Ability Haste scales linearly, so every, every point of Ability Haste you get is worth about is worth more or less about the same. So, to get to where we were, the CDR values we really want to be at with AP Shivana, it's going to take between 50 and 80 Ability Haste to get back to 35 to 45. Very reachable, but not immediately, for reasons we'll get into a bit later. And so far as the jungle itself goes, not much is radically changing, but there are many changes that you need to be aware of. First of all, jungle items are gone entirely. Runic Echoes, Blood Razor, Cinder Hulk, all that is just gone. In, in its place, there are two starting jungle items that will upgrade after you smite five times, giving, granting you the bonuses permanently, and giving you Red Smite or Blue Smite. This means that I never have to see anybody start Machete on Shivana ever again, which is great. Unfortunately, what that also means is that nobody gets Machete, period. The on-hit from Machete is not on the new jungle items. This hurts us in particular because our Q double procced it. Now, we're probably going to be rushing Recurve Bow, and the 15 from that is going to offset this a little bit, but still, 15 is a lot less than 35, so our first few clears are going to suffer, and there's just no way around it. The attack speed on Recurve Bow does make up the difference, but it is significantly more expensive than Machete. So if something goes wrong in the early game and you can't take your first recall on 1000 gold, your second clear is going to be much, much worse. Now, the Talisman Burn is there. Unfortunately, it is no longer a leech effect. That's been replaced with 12% flat Omnivamp. So, the chicken leech strat, where you pull chickens over to red buff to leech off of them while you were killing it, is no longer a thing. But, Omnivamp works on Smite, and on the Herald Eye, so you get much more sustain. It's, it's enough to completely counteract that. Additionally, the burn now has an AP ratio on it, which was just hotfixed up to 30%. So, once you have some AP under your belt, that will speed you up by a couple of seconds as well. So, in summary, your clear is going to be a little bit slower, but 100% healthy. Coming off of your full clear, you'll be able to contest Crab at level 4 with 100% life. You'll just get there a few seconds later than you would have previously. Now, you still want to be taking Blue Smite with Dark Harvest every time, because you can proc it from range. But if you're going any other Keystone, you've got your choice between Blue and Red based on matchup. Especially because now, Red Smite triggers on ability damage. And unfortunately, the final penalty still exists, so be careful how much lane farm you end up taking. Under the camp changes... Gromp has been nerfed substantially both health-wise and damage-wise, and it also heals you on kill instead of Scuttle Crab, so securing Scuttle Crab is going to be much less decisive. It also gives you 20 Fury on kill, which is huge for us. Gromp after gank is going to be really, really good. Look to do that whenever possible. Scuttle's health has been nerfed. It also has a shield instead of its resists now that's also removed on hard CC. It takes about the same amount of time to kill it, so no real big changes for us there. There are many stat changes to camps between 75 and 100, 100 move speed faster, they also have more resists early and less later on. We are back to the Krug meta, boys. Little Krugs are fucking huge. Krugs are where most of the golden experience is in the jungle once again. Look to kill Krugs early and often, and make damn sure you kill all the little ones, since that's where most of the value of the camp is now. The chickens actually hurt you a good bit without access to your talisman leech, so make sure that you kite them out for the last few seconds of your cooldowns. In terms of pathing right now, I'm thinking that it's probably best to start red buff all the time. This lets you kill Krugs early and gives you a full clear to let you contest Scuttle Crab at level 4 with full life. For this reason, Shivana on blue side I think is much stronger than Shivana on red side. It also gives you much easier access to the Dragon Pit through the Blast Cone on blue side if you can't get the Scuttle Crab on bot side river. And I guess I will go over this now as well since it's kind of a starting item. Dark Seal is now fucking broken. It's 15 AP, 40 health, and 5 AP per stack. This item is potentially 65 AP for 350 gold. Always, always, always buy a Dark Seal in every game, no matter what, period. Don't think twice, just buy Dark Seal. Even if you're going AD, you should still buy a Dark Seal. 65 AP for this price point is too much for any type of Shivana to pass up on. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about the first couple of objectives. First Herald is even more important than it was before, because first item Mythic Power Spikes are such a big deal. 
I would even say that you should prioritize Herald over second Drake every time. Where you want to drop it is going to depend on which champion on your team has the strongest mythic item power spike. I would imagine that usually this is going to end up being mid lane just because the mid lane mythic difference is going to give you full map control until the enemy can catch up. Something like a Silas or Talia who need Everfrost to set up for their combo are good examples of champions to spoon feed. First Drake is about the same, but you don't need to spawn kill it, go ahead and kill Krugs first for maximum efficiency. So, on to runes. There are several relevant rune changes, particularly Transcendence. You no longer have to wait until level 10 to get benefit from this rune. Now, you gain 5 ability haste at level 5, 5 more at level 8, and at level 11, 20% of your basic ability cooldowns are refunded on takedown. So, spoiler alert, we are losing the CDR on Nash's Tooth. This kinda sucks. Transcendence lessens that blow quite substantially. So there is now no longer any choice as to what secondary rune to take if you're going f like full AP glass cannon build. You must take sorcery secondary. This rune is mandatory, especially since Cosmic Insight is being changed to no longer give ability haste. Now it's only item haste and summoner spell haste. Inspiration secondary is no longer a thing. There might be there might be some like abuse cases with stacking your, like, item haste, but I don't think that they're particularly uh, applicable for Shivana. Ravenous is also being nerfed from 14% at max stacks to only 11. Riot is very intentionally trying to limit the amount of passive healing in the game with all the new items that are coming into it. So this still works on Rift Herald Eye, and it's still better than everything else in the row for Shivana, so this is still worth taking. Ingenious grants item haste now. This also affects non-active item cooldowns like, Lud like Ludenzak O, for example. There are going to be some abuse cases with this in Cosmic Insight for some champions. For example, Silas might be able to abuse Everfrost stupid hard and get his cooldown down to like 12 seconds. He might have a field day with that, but again, I can't see any particularly relevant abuse cases for Shimana. The Scaling CDR shard has also become a flat ability haste shard. Again, since we are losing the cooldown reduction on Nashers, some builds will have to go this rune and forego the attack speed. This will hurt your clear, but later on in the game it's go it will probably end up being worth it. Keep in mind, however, that while you can still proc your E-Mark four times without the attack speed stat shard, it is pretty tight timing, so you're only going to want to cast your E when you're right on top of your target. So if you choose to go with a haste shard, be cognizant of that fact. And again, the amount of healing on Conqueror is being nerfed when, when fully stacked from 15% to 9%. However, the adaptive force on it is going up by a good bit to compensate. So, now that we've gotten that out of the way, on to playstyles. Now, there are three mythics which are good on Shivana, and we're going to be making a build around each of them. Each build has its own niche and has its own strengths and weaknesses. You are going to want to practice them all to maximize your flexibility so that you're ready for whatever champion select throws at you. First up is Full AP, Big Dick, Glass Cannon, Max Hit, Nagasaki Dragon. Our mythic is Luden's Echo. Now I know what you're thinking, but Vera, we can't build Luden's Echo, it's got mana! No! Wrong. I'm going to sell you this pen harder than Jordan Belfort. Listen to this. So, compared to last patch, Luden got a bit of a buff. As expected, it's a mythic now. The ratio went from 10% to 15%, but it only has 10 haste on it, and the build path is dog shit. You don't want to be caught on Lost Chapter if you can help it, you want to upgrade directly to Luden's. So, what makes it so worth it? The mythic bonus, baby. Flat fucking penetration. If you are building Shivana correctly in Season 10, you already know how fucking broken flat penetration is, and now we've got even more of it, baby. Last season, we could only go up to 33 from Sorcerer's Shoes and Oblivion Orb. Now we can have up to 48. Actually 54 from Sudden Impact, but eh, it's, it's only for your first shot, we won't count that. So as you know, resistances scale logarithmically. The more fit you have, the less damage reduction you get per point. So making a small number smaller is very valuable, and now we can make that small number very, very small, even getting into negative territory. So let's choose Vayne as our punching bag, because fuck Vayne. Vayne has 30 base magic resist, plus 0.5 per level. She can level up 17 times, that gives her 38.5 at level 18. This translates to 27.8% damage reduction. In Season 10, we could only cut that down to 5.5, giving her a 5.3% damage reduction. Pretty good. But in Season 10, we can go even further beyond, cutting that down to negative 9.5, or 8.7% bonus damage. Better than true. This means that that cocky 80 carry player who thinks that he's Gosu and that he can just outplay it forehead is going to get punished like never before. We're going to be doing 14% more damage. And just you wait, it's going to get a whole lot worse than that for them. Next, let's go over our old friend Nash's Tooth. Now the CDR is gone, which fucking sucks, but to compensate for that, the AP went up by 20 to 100, and the ratio went from 15% to 25%. This is actually a very big deal. With just this item, your on-hit damage, from just from Nashers, 
went up by 8.6. And with 300 AP, you'll be doing an extra 30 damage than on 10.22 Nashers. You will be much more threatening outside of your E. You're not just an E button anymore. The rest of your kit will actually matter again. This item is so strong on Shivana, who can triple proc its passive in quick succession, that it rifles Mythics, and you should almost certainly be building it first. This is because the clear speed still matters a lot, and we need to make up what we lost from the jungle item changes. On top of that, its build path is a hell of a lot better. Recurve Bow kicks the crap out of Stinger, and you will actually be able to stand up for yourself in the early game against many meta champions. Especially if you're running a more aggressive Keystone, but more on that later. We're stuck with Dark Harvest for now. Now, I don't need to be telling you to get Sork Boots, but where to get them is more of an open question. You should certainly wait until after Nashers. Nashers is just too huge. I've been usually getting them after my Mythic, but you can certainly make the argument for building them second for the faster power spike. So, there's our core. Now, there's not much haste in there, so we'll have to gain our haste from runes until that point. We've got 10 from Ludens, 10 from Transcendence, and 10 from the Stat Shard, giving us a total of 28 for about 22% cooldown reduction. Not a lot, but with careful aim, it'll be enough to get by. Especially when you consider that we'll be hitting hard enough to make getting a takedown really likely so that Transcendence can help reduce our cooldowns. Now then, on to situational options. Remember that Dark Seal you bought earlier? Magi Soul Stealer, baby. Now it's a little bit more expensive, but now it's got 100 health on it instead of mana. Obviously great for us, that'll help a little bit with staying alive and keeping the stacks going. Now Medjice is a legendary item, which means you get a mythic passive stack for buying it. It is the cheapest legendary by a mile. And because those stacks of flat pen are so valuable, going Medjice is very, very attractive. As before, if your Dark Souls at 10 stacks, look to upgrade right away, but be careful when you do so. If you buy Medjice and immediately run it down, you will lose all 10 stacks, whereas if you just stayed on the Dark Seal, you would have only lost 4, so be careful. If this does happen, since you don't want to lose that stack of flat penetration, it's probably worth it to try and restack the item a few times before you sell it. Next we've got a brand new item, Horizon Focus. It's 100 AP for 3000 gold, and it's got a really cool effect on it. If you hit a target further than 750 units away, you'll get 10% bonus damage on it for 6 seconds and reveal it for the entire duration. And the triggering ability benefits. For reference, 750 range is about 2 steps closer than the max distance on your E, in human form. And in dragon form, you can reach into the next zip code, so there's no worries there. A lot of people are saying this item is really bad, but Shivana begs to differ, because 10% damage bonus on an ability that hits as hard as your E, with a 1.0 ratio, is really, really big. The effect is constant, so once you proc it, you don't have to worry about staying at range, you can go up in combo if it's safe to do so. As a fourth item, this proc is worth in the neighborhood of about 80 ability power, and it only gets more valuable the more AP you pick up. It's essentially a mini death cap with the added utility of an attached reveal. Don't underestimate how valuable the reveal effect can be. It can deny a lot of cute vision plays and make it very easy for your team to chase down a low health target, if they even survive. Now, you really want to pair this item with death cap if at all possible. Percentage damage increases play really well together. So the full glass cannon dream would be Magi's or Void Staff, depending on what you need, Horizon, and death cap. And speaking of, Deathcap's gotten a bit of a nerf this season. Riot really doesn't want people building it fourth, it's now very firmly a fifth or sixth item purchase. It's 200 gold more expensive, but its AP amplification has been reduced by 5%. Again, you really want to pair this with Horizon. You will do a ridiculous amount of damage. But if you really needed another situational item and it comes down to between Horizon or Deathcap for your final item, a lot of it depends on the game state. If you think the game's gonna end soon, then go Horizon to finish the item faster. Horizon with a blue potion is strictly better than Death Cap for less money. Damage-wise, it's very similar and you get the bonus reveal effect on top of it. By this point, the game can end really abruptly, so just building Horizon is probably the safe bet. It also gives you a much earlier penetration stack on Ludens. If you think the game is gonna go really late, you can look to finish Death Cap. It's a much more flexible item and it's less restrictive in terms of the way you can play the game. You'll do a lot more damage from your Nashers ratio, and you'll also be able to RE on top of CC targets when possible, so it's a much more flexible item. The good news is that both of these items build out of Rod, so you can buy Rod and flex whichever way you think you need to. Silly. Our final offensive item, Void Staff, is 150 gold cheaper, loses 5 AP, but has its 40% magic penetration intact. You can build a mini Void Staff now that has 25 AP and 15% magic penetration, so you no longer have to buy the whole thing to get Shred, which is really nice. With this item, even if that Vayne gets sick of being one-shotted and buys a Maw or a Wit's End or something, it's not going to save her. You will still cut her magic resist down to single digits, so priority targets will have to pick up two magic resist items just for you. Morella Namakon lost 50 health, but is now 500 gold cheaper, so it's much more accessible. It lost its flat pen, but its healing reduction, 40% normally, now goes up to 60% on a target below half-life. Oblivion Orb now also has 40% heal cut on it, so we no longer have to wait to get what we need here either. 
It is now also 800 gold, the same as Executioner's, so we finally get some parity there. I would say that at least two members on your team need to have healing reduction if it's necessary. Three might be overkill, but it's up to you if you want more redundancy. Zonia's Hourglass is 400 cheaper as well in exchange for 10 ability power. This is a ridiculously good deal, and perhaps the change that I disagree with most strongly. Using Stasis Well is game-changing, and you should have to pay for that power. It is now unlikely that you'll be stuck with a broken stopwatch for a long period of time with how cheap the completed item is now. One note, do not build this with Horizon Focus. You built Zonia's because you're either scared of being dived, or because you want to RE on top of the enemy. Neither of these situations are good ones to have Horizon in. However, it does pair very well with the stacked Magi's, so if you find yourself with 25 stacks, you may want to pick one up to help protect them. Unfortunately, Banshee's Veil is still kind of a meme. In most situations in which Banshee's would be useful, Zonia's is just more so, and, and it's more flexible. For example, you could buy Banshee's Veil against a Fed Syndra and block the first orb of her ultimate, or you could buy a Zonia's Hourglass and immune the entire thing. Which one's more useful? So, in summary, this build will give you unmatched and terrifying single-hit damage, approaching 2,000 on a target that does not buy magic resist. Flat penetration is really, really stupid. Ludens as a mythic choice also helps you with your clear speed. But, the low amount of haste on the build means that you are a one-shot Andy. Transcendence helps, but you need takedowns to proc it. You are only going to want to go this build if you have a significant amount of engage and hard CC on your team to, to guarantee that you can land your money shot. If there are many mobile threats on the enemy team who can evade being locked down by your front line, going this build is extremely risky, and I would highly advise going a more haste-oriented build. So let's make one. We'll call it, uh, Hiroshima Dragon. Not as big of a nuke, but much more frequently applied. We are going to be building around Night Harvester. It's got 250 health, 80 AP, 15 haste out the gate, and its mythic passive is 5 haste per stack. It has a proc that triggers off of any damage dealt to a champion, and the base damage on it is frankly absurd. It'll trigger for over 200 damage by the time you pick it up, but it has a very long cooldown per champion, about 40 seconds. This is way more than Ludens, and honestly I expect this to get nerfed by a little bit. Your mid game will be very, very strong. Now you're still going Sorcerers and Nashers, going Nashers first by the way, as before. But fourth, you're going to really want to pick up a Cosmic Drive. This is another new item that's all about haste, and it has 30 on it. It also builds out of Kindle Gem and Fiendish Codex, so you get a good amount of haste on the way there as well. On spell hit, you get 10 plus 20% of your haste and movement speed. There is no cooldown on this effect. This combined with the movement speed on Night Harvester means that you will be very hard to chase down and finish off. At this point, you'll have 55 haste from your items and 10 to 18 from your runes, so you'll be at about 40% CDR where you were before. It just took us a little bit longer to get there. You may also build this in place of Void or Magi's in the Ludens build if you really want the extra cooldown reduction. From here, you've got two situational slots. Banshees and Zonias both have 10 haste on them, so you should strongly consider those for your defensive options. As far as offense goes, Deathcap, Horizon, Void, Magi's are all great. And if you find yourself needing healing reduction and that son of a bitch Ezreal refuses to buy Exe, get Morello. In closing, the high amount of haste on this build will make your EO reliable and consistent threat in fights. You'll end up having more CDR than we had in Season 10, getting your E down to between a 4.2 and 4.3 second cooldown. There's also 450 health in this build, so you'll be able to survive taking a hit or two. The movement speed procs on Night Harvester and Cosmic Drive combined with your W will make you very difficult to chase down and kill. You will also be extremely strong in the mid game. The base damage on Night Harvester is disgusting. 200 to 250 base damage is frankly too damn high. However, since you have less penetration, MR purchases will end up hurting you a lot more. Similar to Season 10, you'll struggle to deal with heavy frontline and bruiser champions. You also won't scale nearly as hard into the late game, and an AD carry with Maw and Shield Bow will be able to shrug off your damage pretty easily. You'll need help to finish off targets at 6 items. It will probably end up taking more than one shot to threaten a carry in the late game. And finally, in Season 11, we have very real AP bruiser support. This is now a real legitimate playstyle. I've been experimenting with it a good bit, and it feels very strong it might end up being the default way forward. It uses all of the item changes exceptionally well. Because you're playing frontline instead of backline, you can take a stronger keystone than Dark Harvest. Conqueror is good, PTA, even Hail of Blades may have a place. You will still absolutely delete squishes at close range. You still tank pretty well, but you'll need to be careful of CC. You are very much a drain tank, and a drain tank that can't drain is just dead in the water. You're also still pretty effective at range. Your E will still hurt people at 200 to 300 AP. You also have the option to go Red Smite, since you no longer need Blue Smite to proc Dark Harvest. And our mythic that makes all of this possible is called Riftmaker. It has 15% Omnivamp on it. Conqueror has 9% when fully stacked, and Ravenous has another 11, so you'll have 35% total. Its mythic bonus is Percentage Penetration, so you'll be able to tear through frontline tanks very easily. The item stacks over 5 seconds to 15% damage amplification, and at max stacks, it becomes true damage. 
To understand how strong a damage amplification effect like that is, consider that last season every gangplank worth his salt was buying Leandri's Torment 3rd. With your jungle item, you will have 38% omnivamp versus monsters. A 3 item solo baron is very possible with full ravenous hunter stacks and 2 charges of smite, and a 4 item solo baron is very, very easy. Look to sneak baron if you see the enemy team bot side, especially if they have their jungler with them. Now, we're still rushing Nashers, and a more aggressive keystone behind this item makes it terrifying. Conqueror behind a recurve bow already feels really strong, but PTA or Hail of Blades behind it would be damn near unbeatable in the early game, especially with a red smite. And the new stronger proc when Nashers is completed is nutty. Proccing Nashers five times with Hail of Blades deletes people. It's really filthy. You've got some choice of boots depending on the enemy composition. I'd say that Sorcery Shoes are better than Lucidities because of the percentage magic penetration on Riftmaker, but don't be afraid to go Tabbies or Merc Treads if you think you need them. Or whatever the new Tabbies are called now. Boy oh boy, we have a lot of situational options with this build, so let's get into it. First up, for aggressive options, we have a new item, Demonic Embrace. This is a new anti-tank item that's much more aggressive than defensive. You get a 1.5% max health per second burn for 4 seconds, and between 10 and 20 resists based on the number of champions burning. Now you're not going to be able to keep this fully stacked very often, and even if you could, this shouldn't be your only defensive choice. You will still end up being very squishy, but you'll drain a lot of health from their front line, and Baron Nasher does not like this item. Building this item fourth makes Solo Baron very, very easy. Next up we've got Rylize. Its cost went up by 400, health by 50, and its slow is now 30% up from 20. This is a great item against melee carries and low mobility range champions. It also, thankfully, builds out of belt again instead of just a ruby crystal. Morello's AP health stat line is great for you. Volunteer to pick up healing reduction for your team if you need it. With a Void Staff, MR will go boom. 60% reduction is absurd. Remember that most of the time you will probably be hitting frontline, so keep hitting that tab key when you see those Force of Natures or Abyssal Masks start to come through, pick up a Void Staff. Finally, Lich Bane. It lost its haste, but its movement speed is now 10%. Its ratio was buffed to 60%, but it got immediately reverted back down to 50 because as it turns out, that makes Fizz the best champion in the game. Who could have seen that one coming? You are tanky enough to use Lichbane effectively if there's no big threat on the enemy team, so this is your final greedy option for if you get super fed. Now there are many, many possible defensive options with this build. If you're not ridiculously far ahead in the game, you're probably going to end up needing something a little bit stronger than Banshees or Zonias. As I said before, just building AP health makes you really squishy, so you're going to want to pick up at least one of these depending on the situation. And usually as a fourth item. Dear lord, you've got Death Stance, Spirit Visage, Randuin's, Force of Nature, Wit's End, Gargoyles, Sterex. All of which are situationally really good, and I'm going to be going over all of them. So for armor options, Death Stance has been retooled into an anti-physical damage item. It's got 40 armor, but its real value is the bleed passive. 35% of physical damage taken becomes a bleed effect, giving you plenty of time to heal up and get a takedown. This bleed effect is cleansed on takedown and heals you for 10% of your max life. Get this item versus 5 AD fourth every game. I did this last night and it felt fucking great. You will be absolutely unkillable and this should satisfy your defensive needs on its own, letting you finish your build with more aggressive items. Next up, Randuin's Omen. It's been retooled to offer flat attack damage reduction on hit. It's got 80 armor on it, which is quite a bit. Its active still slows, but also reduces attack damage by 10% and crit damage by 20%. Now, diving through an entire enemy team to apply this to the AD carry is very risky, but this item is really good for dealing with fed melee crit champions, Yasuo, Yone, Trindamir. Because so much of this item's mitigation was moved into its active, you can use it to peel for your team. If that Yasuo gets past you and starts hitting your Kog'Maw, he's going to be doing much less damage to him. This item's active is nearly as good as exhaust against a champion like Yasuo. Oh, and in case you were wondering, at 3000 life, you get about 15% flat damage reduction on hit. This item is clearly scaled for like a Cho'Gath or a Scion, something with much more health than you'll have access to. So Morello is a much better anti-healing option for you, but if you need armor and heal cut, you should still consider Thornmail. Oh, look at her. Little sweetheart. For our magic resist options, we've got Spirit Visage, which is a much stronger item that's got way more stats on it. The heal bonus on it was cut from 30% to 25%, but now it also increases shielding. So you can pair this item with the Gargo Stone Plate and Steric's Gauge for really, really fucking big shields. Wit's End lost its life on hit conditional, and it's been replaced with 30 attack damage, as well as 20 movement speed on hit. This is what you buy to ruin champions like Mordekaiser, Diana, and Rumble. Force of Nature is back from the dead, and it gives a crap ton of magic resist and movement speed. If you're up against a lot of really fed backline mages that you might have trouble chasing down and sticking to, buy Force of Nature. For that purpose, it pairs very well with Wit's End. The shield on Maw is designed for 80 carries, so it scales like dog shit for us. 
Now for our shielding options to pair with Visage. Gargoyle Stoneplate has been massively reworked. It now no longer reduces your damage, so it's a perfectly viable item for a drain tank. Instead of doubling your health, it gives you a shield for 100% of your bonus health. Now, although it does decay over two and a half seconds, it should buy you the time with Last Stand activated to heal back up a decent bit, or duck out of the fight once you've soaked as much as you can. It has 60 armor and magic resist, making it a really good one-stop shop for resistances. So buying this item fourth and then rounding out your build with Demon's Embrace and uh, Rallies is a really good idea. Also, Steric's Gage looks like it's really good this season. With 3,000 life and 5 stacks, you will get a non-decaying shield for 1,400, or 1,750 with Spirit Visage, on top of the life regeneration it grants you. Now, let's consider how we would round out our build in different situations. If we have a huge lead and we don't respect anyone, we can probably get away with going Demon Rally Lich. Versus 5 ID, Demon Rally Lich is probably the way to go. Into Heavy Crit, DD Randuin's Rally. Demon Void Lich against a huge frontline. Visage Fawn Demon might be good into a heavy magic backline. If it's a heavy magic frontline, you can substitute Wits for Fawn. Into an all-around balanced composition, Gargoyle Demon Rally might be good enough. This would give you a really good mix of offense and defense. It might also be a good idea to sit on Aegis and finish Demon so that your Gargoyle Shield isn't pathetic when you finish it. And finally, if your team lacks frontline and all you need to do is stand in front of your Lulu Kog'Maw or that 20-0 Azir, you can go Visage, Gargoyle, Steric. This build will give you about 3200 points of shielding, an entire second life bar. This should buy plenty of time for your hyper carry to clean house. And finally, as like an honorable mention, I'm not sure if it'll be good or not, Ravenous Hydra is actually really interesting. Ravenous now gives 15% Omni Vamp instead of just physical vamp. It's got 20 haste on it, which is nice, and the AD plays well with your attack speed from Nashers. And your E also has a small AD ratio on it. It's time at proc, now procs off of spells, which is interesting, so if you E a stack of champions, you'll do a lot of damage and a lot of healing. An interesting idea I've been playing around with is what happens if you rush time at for clear speed instead of recurve and just rush this in rift maker. This would give you 50% omni vamp really quickly. I think Nashus is too generally good to pass up on, but who knows? Maybe it's worth it. Is it a meme? Is it a dream? Who can say? But it might be worth trying out. So, in summary, this build uses the new Nashus really well and it makes you really strong early game. It turns you into a very potent duelist and a very strong answer to bruises and frontline champions. You're even strong enough to turn champions like Renekton, who are famous for their dueling potential, into boots. This build is also extremely flexible, and with enough knowledge and experience, you'll be able to adapt well to any situation. Now, you're not going to kill anything outright from ranged, but you'll still do plenty of damage, and you'll still command respect. And again, you are very much a drain tank, so be very careful about being CC'd for long periods of time. You're not a true frontline, you're very much an off tank, so you'd still want to have like a Scion or something beefier from the top lane. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about why we don't want to go the other mythic items. Leandris has a ton of mana on it, and you also have no periodic damage to keep its burn rolling over long periods of time, so it will almost certainly fall off between your E-casts, and you will lose all of that penetration and have to stack it again from scratch. Everfrost has a really short CD with a really big ratio on it. It might be really good for wave clear if you're trying to play AP mid if Loon's Echo isn't enough, but it's got mana on it again, and the mythic passive is 15 AP per stack. Not great. We would really much rather have something like Penetration or Haste over just a flat AP. The range on the active is also pretty short. Great for a champion like Silas, not so great for us. Now, Rocket Belt does have flat pen as its mythic bonus, but using it well is too risky for us to get away with. We're not Fizz, we're not Echo. So I think that it's much too dangerous to use this item effectively if we're not going really tanky, in which case, why wouldn't you just go Rift Maker? And to tie everything together, I made a couple of spreadsheets to compare where we are now to where we were before. Who doesn't like spreadsheets, right? For these mockups, I'm ignoring all runes except Transcendence and Cosmic Insight, and the Attack Speed Shard versus the Haste Shard. I'm assuming that you'll be taking the Hay Shard with Ludens and Attack Speed for everything else. So as far as our core goes, we are strictly stronger at close and long range because the new mythic items are so strong. Our core is also cheaper because we don't have to buy Orb anymore, but this comes at the cost of cooldown reduction. You can see that Night Harvester is a little stronger than Ludens at this point in the game. And Rift Maker is also worth respecting. 580 damage is a lot, especially when you're healing for like a third of that. I also took the time to fully map out what a few different builds would look like. You can pause the video and look at this in more detail, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things here. First, uh, yeah, that's a big number. That's a really, really big number. You thought I was joking about 2,000 damage, didn't you? Remember, no runes, no blue pot. Have fun. That poor Vayne's not gonna know what hit her. You can also see exactly how much power you're sacrificing for cooldown reduction here. Between the Nagasaki, Nagasaki Light with the Cosmic Drive, and Hiroshima builds, there's like a 24 point spread in cooldown reduction. And damage wise, it's like 700 points. So Ludens with a Cosmic Drive ends up being a good middle ground if you don't need a Void Staff. Each of these builds ends up being much more expensive than Season 10 because Runic Echoes was such a cheap and cost-effective power spike, but we're also much stronger across the board. With the Night Harvester, for example, we're close to full Glass Cannon Season 10 with Zonia's Hourglass in our build, and even a fully completed Riftmaker build will still have to be respected from range. Uh, here's another really big number. The new Spirit Visage is pretty good. 
I also wanted to specifically point out exactly how goddamn strong the Horizon Focus proc is so that nobody ends up sleeping on the item. It is worth a lot of AP. I said it was a mini death cap, and I'm not kidding. And here's a quick little illustration of death cap versus Horizon as a sixth item. If you're planning on operating solely from range, you'll do just as much damage with a cheaper item plus utility on top of it. And as I'm wrapping up and putting this together, Mark Yetter just posted the preview for patch 10.24 on Twitter. All three of our mythics are being nerfed, as well as Nash's Tooth, Lich Bane, and Demonic Embrace. Now they said specifically they're targeting actives and procs, so I expect the penetration on Ludens to survive, which is why the item is stupid, but they'll probably bring the ratio back down to 10%. They'll be hitting the base damage on Night Harvester for sure, it never should have went live with that number, and I expect them to bring Riftmaker down to 10% damage like old Leandris. Nashers to 20% AP on hit is my prediction there. I'm not sure what they're doing to Lich Bane, it's already weaker than it was last patch because it lost its CDR. And the dot on Demonic Embrace will probably go down to 1.25%. I don't expect these builds to radically change, everything should still be usable, but this is rad games we're talking about, so anything could happen. Under item buffs, they also have something called AP Jungles, so who knows what that means. And after entirely too long, I think that finally brings us to the end! Thanks a lot for watching, guys, and I hope this ended up being helpful. I'm sorry that I was so late in getting this out, I wanted to play a few dozen games to make sure that I actually know what I'm talking about. Generally speaking, this should be a pretty good thrust of where AP Shivana's heading in Season 11. The Ludens and Harvester builds are pretty straightforward, but a lot still needs to be worked out with regards to Riftmaker. I'll let you guys know what ends up working best where. Early results have been quite encouraging, and I think it's going to end up being really strong. Once I have Riftmaker fully figured out, I'm going to be looking towards Fighter and Juggernaut builds. And apparently Full Tank is pretty good too. Now that I'm done with this monstrosity, we're back on schedule starting tomorrow. Tomorrow's game features Riftmaker with Death Stance. It should be pretty entertaining. And with that, I'm finally out of things to say! See you next time.